It's May 10th, 1508, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. It's fair to say that Michelangelo didn't have a fun time painting the Sistine Chapel, and in fact, in an irony-laced memo he wrote to himself on this day in 1508, noting his acceptance of the commission, he said, Today I, Michelangelo sculptor, have agreed to paint the vault of the chapel of Pope Sixtus, which really captures the reason for his reluctance itself, which was that he really thought of himself as a sculptor, not as a painter at all. But in the end, I think it's also fair to say that on balance he did a pretty good job of it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he certainly had attention to detail, didn't he? But, I mean, if you're going to accept as your first big painting job the Sistine Chapel... I think you've got to have a pretty pretty big idea of yourself. I mean, he was a genius, so I mean, it was justified. It was quite interesting looking at that memo that he wrote and looking at some of the letters that he wrote to people complaining about the process. In one of them, he writes, I am not in the right place. I am not a painter. This idea of, mm. sort of self-doubt around what he was doing when it was very clear, I think, to everyone all along that he was the world's best living artist mm. and he was creating a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, well, he was suspicious because the world of Renaissance artists was a bit of a hotbed of skullduggery. He thought his enemies had set him up to fail, which actually there's evidence that that is the case. So what had happened was the whole reason that that Michelangelo was in the Vatican was that three years earlier, the, the newly elected Pope, Julius II, who was obviously a very forward-thinking person, commissioned Michelangelo to sculpt his tomb in advance. It was a very mm. <laughs> complicated commission. I knew there was something on my shortlist that I haven't got round to yet. Commission a tomb sculptor. It's never too early to start. <laughs> So he got this high-profile gig. It was a very complicated tomb. It would actually take 40 years to finish because Julius died and his successors weren't really that fussed about getting it complete. Like, I mean, why would you be? But his sculpting rival, Donato Bramante, was apparently bitter about losing out on the tomb gig and maliciously suggested Michelangelo as the right person to take on this enormous task of painting the ceiling. And Michelangelo was really quite far from happy about it. A, because he wanted to finish the tomb because he'd started it, and B, because he really did worry that he wasn't up to the task, but he did begrudgingly agree to take it on, I guess because you don't tend to say no to the Pope. I don't believe this. I'm sorry. (laughs) He knew he was up to the task. I know that you're right that all the documents tell us that he thought he wasn't, but he knew (laughs) because he was being asked to do a depiction of the Twelve Apostles, and instead he came back with a quote for 300 different characters. <laughs> that is that is not the action of a man who doubts himself. No, that's just like any good contractor who wants to stray from their brief and, <laughs> and add in, oh, no, we've, there's definitely a hole here that we're going to need to fill. <laughs> he wasn't even commissioned to paint the ceiling. He was commissioned to paint the bits around the edge of mm. the ceiling where there were 12 spaces for the 12 apostles. Because I think we tend to think of Michelangelo painting the ceiling sort of in conjunction with the chapel being built. Yes. But it had actually been built decades earlier and it already had a painted ceiling. It was kind of a bland design though. You'll have seen it if you've been in many churches around Europe. It was just a, a dark dark blue backdrop with with gold stars on it and so Michelangelo came back to the Pope and said oh, well, kind of like you say Ollie it's a bit incongruous they said on one hand I don't feel like I'm up to the job but on the other hand I will do it but only if you allow me complete free reign and I want to paint the whole ceiling <laughs> and actually taking it so far making it so over the top I mean it is stunning but making it so intricate and detailed I would argue doesn't really fit with the building. Like, actually, if you look at the building from the Mm. outside, it's actually quite a sombre building. It's quite imposing and unlikable, fortress-like chapel. And it already had frescoes in it by famous artists. And it just needed (laughs) a little bit of lift (laughs) in the ceiling to look finished. And I kind of feel like now it is just... it's, it's It's a work by Michelangelo that happens to have a chapel attached to it. It's actually, I would say, almost out of proportion with what he was being commissioned to do. But I guess when you're a Michelangelo, every chapel looks like a canvas, you know, or something, (laughs) you know. But I think that it was just a task that involved this enormous amount of personal physical discomfort. He didn't actually lie on his back to achieve the painting of the roof as many people think, but rather he had created his own kind of scaffolding. An architect had suggested that they hang something from the roof and he sit on that, but he was like, no, 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 nobody's touching my roof except me. So he built up these scaffolds from the floor and he was looking up from them. He wasn't lying on his back, but it must have been enormously uncomfortable having paint and also, I presume, uh, plaster drip on him because Mm. the 
the act of making uh, frescoes is to mix the paint in with the with the plaster which is why it lasts for such an enormously long time and it, there wasn't much light in there either especially so close right. to the ceiling of course so he was squinting yeah. and it, it gave him long lasting eye damage and also apparently the scaffolding didn't come down until he'd completed the entire thing so he wasn't able to get a full sense of how it was all going although i'm sure he <laughs> he probably knew it wasn't going badly um, but until the final day so he was actually among the group of people who were witness to its unveiling and it would have come as a sort of an experiential thing for him mm. too yeah but that's so cool though isn't it like if you believe as deeply as he believed and had faith and it'd been commissioned by the pope this is what i'm getting at like i think there's a lot of performative kind of self-doubt and a lot of sort of, oh, I don't know if it's any good. Well, yes. you know, you're the best. You've spent four years doing it. <laughs> and if you look at these complaints that he made, which I'm sure were genuine about his physical health and all the rest of it, they are written next to a doodle of himself that's kind of funny in the form of a sonnet. <laughs> so, he, so here's some of his highlights. <laughs> my stomach's squashed under my chin. My beard's pointing at heaven. My brain's crushed in a casket. It's kind of funny, isn't it? My poor ass strains to work yeah, as a counterweight. Yeah. Every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin <laughs> hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I mean, I think he can see the humour in it, but that doesn't mean that he's not taking it incredibly yes. seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean that he genuinely would have at any point, I don't think, wanted to stop once he'd started. No, but also he was learning this craft as he went, which is evidenced again by the fact that the depictions of God that he included in the Sistine Chapel were the very last things that he did because he, that was one thing he really didn't want to mess up. Yeah. So, so he left space for them and came back and did those after he'd sort of mucked around with other <laughs> with other people of great significance. I always, when I'm, when I'm painting, like to do the border first. Yeah, you know, yeah right. <laughs> Big bit. Yeah. And he took quite an abstract approach to the composition as well. I mean, if you think of the original function of frescoes and stained glass windows, it was that when services were in Latin, the ordinary people who couldn't understand clerical Latin could look around and glean some of the biblical stories. But Michelangelo didn't go for straightforward depictions. For one thing, he included not only biblical prophets, but also some classical prophets as well. So figures who weren't mm. in the Bible and wouldn't have been familiar to the average person. The painting covers 500 square metres. And there are 300 figures within that. And we still don't know who some of them are. It's still a debate among theologians exactly who some of the figures are supposed to be depicting. Well, it was all subjected to a massive restoration work. This is flashing a long way into the future, not least of all because the use of that particular chapel is for the election of popes, which famously involves releasing a lot of smoke of two different potential colours, either black for if they haven't reached a decision. Did the popes smoke damaged the roof of the Sistine Chapel? It did, yeah. And also the fact that they, you know, in the early days it would have been all candle light and, you know, there would have been smoke. That's a design flaw though, isn't it? Here I am saying what a genius Michelangelo was. That is, that's basic, isn't it? Like, what are you going to use this room for, mate? Well, we release a load of smoke when we elect the popes. Okay, maybe I shouldn't paint the ceiling. It's actually, that's fundamental. Well, I mean, it did last for a long time. It was only only in yes, the 1980s and 1990s that the restoration took place, which took great liberties with assuming what was damage and what was the artist's intent. And plenty of contemporary art historians question whether actually some of the stuff that was erased, because I don't know if you've seen before and after pictures, but it's much brighter. It's like it's almost sort of Technicolor mm. now, where it was very, very faded and dim previously, unsurprisingly. It's 500 years old. But actually, many of these art historians suggested that they'd taken away some of the foreboding shading that Michelangelo had intended. And it wouldn't have been the first time that Michelangelo's intentions in the Sistine Chapel were disregarded, because what had happened was that despite the fact that he didn't seem to, on the surface, enjoy doing the ceiling very much, he came back 20 years later to paint the Last Judgment, which covers the altar wall. But yeah. what was controversial about that was that he depicted Jesus and Mary naked, like actually fully naked, not just with, you know, a kind of drape across them, as you often see in Renaissance art. And so one of his apprentices was hired later to cover them with clothes and when you look at it now you know they're covered with sort of conveniently placed drapes but that wasn't done by Michelangelo his intent was to have them naked 
And actually, the criticism had been levelled during the time when he was actually doing the work by a papal assistant called Biagio de Cessine, who uh, said on inspecting the painting before it was completed, it was most disgraceful that in so sacred a place there should have been depicted all those nude figures exposing themselves so shamefully. But Michelangelo, who wasn't fond of criticism at the best of times, got his revenge by painting de Cessine as Minos, one of the damned who's descending into hell in the bottom right corner. <laughs> of the painting with donkey ears for good measure. <laughs> that is some good trolling. Yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> Actually, a baddie looks like a big sort of 1.4 ton hunk of silicon. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.